Welcome, everybody. I am Angela Weck. I'm the Executive Director of the Peoria Area World Affairs Council, and we do try to host something every month to remind people in Central Illinois just how connected we are to the rest of the world right here at home in Central Illinois. So it's my pleasure today to introduce our two speakers. Um, uh, and <laughs> before we get started, to draw your attention to the cards on the table, we are hosting General David Petraeus on August 19th. And so if you have any questions about that, catch me before you leave. The United States, Mexico, and Canada agreement, the USMCA, took effect on July 1st, 2020. It's a key trade agreement that covers rules of origin for goods, pharmaceuticals, digital trade, and labor protections, among numerous other key sectors and topics. While some believe that the USMCA is simply a rebranded North American free trade agreement, and I admit I have called it NAFTA 2.0. <laughs> there are important differences between the two agreements, presenting challenges and opportunities. Today, our distinguished guests will share their insights with their own trade, with our own trade expert, Jim Ryan. Ambassador Rina Torres Mendeville is the Council General of Mexico and Chicago. She's a career diplomat and has extensive experience within the Mexican Foreign Service. She has served as Council of Mexico in San Antonio, Texas. Director General of Protection of Mexicans Abroad at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Council of Mexico and the Fresno, of California, and Director General for Latin America and the Caribbean. In addition, she has been the Deputy General Coordinator of Advisors to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Deputy Director General, I'm sorry, Deputy Director General for Human Rights and Democracy. She worked for six years in the political department of the Mexican Embassy in the United States and was head of the Chancellery at the Mexican Embassy in the Czech Republic. Ambassador Torres was a research associate at Harvard University and represented the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Hemispheric Security Course at the Inter-American Defense College. She holds a degree in international relations from the National Autonomous University of Mexico and a master's degree from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Madeleine Fakir is a recognized expert in leadership, corporate credit administration, credit risk, and operations credit enhancements at international trade. Over the course of her career, Ms. Fakir has held global executive positions for companies in diverse sectors of the economy, including agri-food, technology, software, telecommunications, pulp and paper, and personal care. Prior to, the appointment, to her appointment as Council General of Canada, Ms. Fakir was the corporate credit chief at Dome Tar Corporation, providing oversight and support for credit risk management on a global scale. At Domtar, she implemented innovative, proven strategies and deployed efficient credit structures across the Americas and in Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. Um, as a seasoned board director, Ms. Thakir experience in corporate governance spans over 25 years of active involvement on boards and committees of numerous organizations in the cultural, health, education, and business sectors. She's been a board member of Investment Quebec, a member of the board of the University of Montreal, and an expert panel member of the Canadian Center for the Purpose of Cooperation. Um, sorry, I lost my clothes. <laughs> she holds a director's education program diploma in governance from the Rotman School of Management of the University of Toronto, an ICDD designation from the Institute of Corporate Directors a mini MBA from McGill Executive Institute and a certificate in finance from HEC Montreal, jointly with the Credit Institute of Mexico. And she is a member of the Order of Canada. James Ryan is the international trade, ex uh, sorry, international trade specialist in the Turner Center for Entrepreneurship at Bradley University. He has a wealth of overseas experience and the passion for international trade. Jim has taught at colleges in Singapore and Malaysia and worked for San Jose-based technology firms in Asia, where he held positions in international contracts and negotiations, concentrating on foreign market entry and startup operations in South Asia, the UK, and the US. He launched an import-expert venture in 1997, expanding it to include retail operations in Kuala Lumpur in 2001 and Miami Beach in 2002. He is currently the coordinator for the Foster College of Business Global Scholars Program and lectures in international business. He is currently involved in the university's recruiting efforts to attract more international students and enjoys being active in a number of student organizations as an advisor. At Native Purian, 
He has a BA from Stetson University in Florida and an LLB from the University of Glamorgan School of Law and Finance in Wales. After completing his law degree, he received a diploma from the Institute on International Comparative Law at Oxford University in England, then returned to the U.S. to receive an LLM in International and Comparative Law from the University of San Diego School of Law. It is my pleasure to welcome these distinguished guests. I hope I have not totally destroyed your names. <laughs> <laughs> and um, with that, I'll turn it over to Jim, and I think Ambassador Torres will be starting off with her presentation. So thank you, everyone. So um, good afternoon, everyone. I am, oh, of course, humble. Madeline is an expert in the business sector economy. You heard her background. And James as well. So I'm the one that knows nothing about this here. So please be kind <laughs> to me when you make your questions. Um, I am delighted to be here. Uh, after a couple of years, you know, we had the pandemic in between. This is my first visit to Peoria to this one. Um, we couldn't um, bring continuity to many of the things that we discussed. I think it was 19... Um, 2019, when I was here, uh, but we will do that this time because we, you know, we had a lot of pending issues that we planned to do, and uh, you know, circumstances changed, so we couldn't do that. Uh, I'm really happy to be here, as I said, to speak uh, also with my dear colleague Madeleine Fakia. Um, last time I was here with uh, the former Consul General of Canada, so this is already a tradition, right? We have to do this. Um, year after year, and it makes a lot of sense. This is a very strong, economically strong area of the state of Illinois, and uh, it's in the interest of you, all the towns here, the stakeholders here, but also to the Mexican government, and I'm sure also the Canadian government, to have a strong presence here and a strong relationship with uh, all of you here in, in Peoria. I'm going to give you a, a general idea. I'm going to be very brief because I, I want to hear your comments and questions, even if they are tough, I will, I will handle those. Um, and just to give you a general idea of uh, what we do, who we are, and how we do it. Um, let me start by saying that Mexico is a key player in the global stage. Some of you know that already, some of you may not. We're the 12th largest economy in the world. Uh, we are um, very strong, we have very strong demographics. We have a population close to 130 million people many of them around the Mexico City area. We we're just talking about that. Um, Mexico and the U.S. share almost a 2,000-mile border. And as you can tell, the relationship that the U.S. The US uh, has with Canada is very much determined by geography, but the same happens to Mexico, the relationship that you have with Mexico. It's very impressive that we trade over a um, million dollars, uh, U.S. dollars per minute in, in that border. It's just kind of mind-blowing every time that we hear that, that um, data. We have 48 ports of entry, and as you can see, the, the, the crosses um, and at the border are very intense. I have to say that all the good things that reflect the, the, the positive aspects of our relationship happen at the border, and we don't hear a lot about those. We hear, you know, what makes the news and all that, but also, you know, the people, the families, the trade, and um, all the good uh, connections that we have between our two countries are reflected on the border. Um, Mexico has also 16 major cargo seaports, 12 major cargo airports. Um, you've heard, uh, and you will hear a lot about this, about the North American bloc as, as a strong space in the, in the world, that is a space of prosperity. Um, it's getting stronger, and it, it's also only because of the um, mechanisms that we have established throughout our history it was these regional um, activities and dynamism. Uh, you know that NAFTA first and then now USMCA have been a key part of this. Um, we want to make sure that our three countries benefit from this uh, alliance. <coughs> Ooh, I'm sorry, I have a bit of a, a throat thing, uh, so bear with me please. Uh, we want to make sure that businesses remain within the North America advantageous, uh, that are in a way advantageous for the entire region and boost economic activity, create jobs, um, strong um, 
stimulate local industries, uh, reduce um, reliance on external sources. We can talk about China if you want, or if you don't, it's better. <laughs> uh, and we, uh, we want to, to continue building a, a strong and well-integrated regional economy. We want to make it a nutshell. We want to continue making of these the most prosperous region in the world. We have the potential of that. You will see the figures. And it's only a matter of all of us working towards the same direction. And I think that USMCA does that for the three countries. Uh, let me now talk a little bit about um, the relationship that we have with Illinois. Uh, you know the strengths of your state. You know, you, be, you live that uh, every day. Um, Illinois is a trade powerhouse. It ranks in the, four, the, in the fourth place in the US by international trade volume. <coughs> uh, but it's interesting to think of Mexico as one of your strongest uh, trading partners. Um, Illinois is also Mexico's fourth state by trade volume after the usual suspects. You know, Texas, we, we, we mentioned that a while a bit ago. Texas, California, and Michigan. And Michigan only because the automotive industry, otherwise it would be Illinois. We trade a lot of things. Um, I, I, I keep saying that, you know, if you eat uh, strawberries this morning with your breakfast, it's likely that those strawberries came from Mexico. And if you're gonna have a beer after this event somewhere, it's very likely that that beer will come from Mexico. Um, you know that uh, Illinois is uh, one of the best buyers that we have of beer in the world. I just wonder why. So, <laughs> so out of that intensity <laughs> and that trade a volume, 71% corresponds to uh, its top four trading partners, the, the one that Illinois has. That's Canada, of course, China, Mexico, and Germany. And this is an interesting figure. You see, the trade that Mexico has with uh, Illinois surpasses the one that we have with Spain, India, France, and Chile combined. That's amazing. I'm pretty sure that you didn't know that. Um, so what, the, the, what we have is a very, perhaps, silent relationship. And what we need to do is to talk more about that and how our communities benefit from, from this uh, relationship. Uh, let me say a word about agriculture and how important that um, acti economic activity is for our trade. Um, and, and I know that it's important in this region. 83% of all Illinois corn exports go to Mexico. 16% of all Illinois soybean exports also go to Mexico. And particularly the one in soybean increases every year. So that is uh, pretty, pretty impressive. Um, and now let me say a word about the USMCA and you know, the changes that were made. We discussed those changes uh, four years ago, three years ago when I was here. So those are fully into force now and have already, you know, uh, paying uh, fruits to, to, to the three partners. Um, this USMCA, as, as it was reviewed, includes some innovative provisions on labor. You may have heard that, you know, those things could have been harming for businesses getting into Mexico, or perhaps you know, created some doubts or some noise about what was gonna happen. Uh, you know that um, paired with the uh, negotiation of the new treaty uh, was the coming into power of a new uh, political party in Mexico at the highest level of the liberal presidency with a highly social agenda in, in, in their um, proposals, electoral proposals. Um, so what has happened is that um, the labor value contract in USMCA requires and uh, now mandates at least 40% or 45% of vehicles to be made by workers earning at least $16 per hour. And I think that's just catching up with reality. It was not correct, it was not right, what was happening with Mexican workforce, and I think it was good development, uh, not only for the Mexican economies, but for the three economies that we made that impulse uh, to, to benefit our workers. So another thing is, um, not cash standards enshrine freedom of association. <coughs> the possibility for our workers to unionize was a strange thing. Um, as I said, um, 
minimum wage increase by 116% in Mexico. That change that I mentioned <coughs> resulted in this, in this benefit for our workers. Um, so um, an average salary in Mexico um, increased by 26% between 2019 and 2024. So the, as part of this new uh, framework, in 1923, the foreign direct investment reached 36 billion. That's a 27 increase from the year before. So this only shows that this uh, USMCA, the um, son or daughter, I would say, of NAFTA, is working pretty well for the three countries. You will see that in a bit. The other good uh, figure is that unemployment rate has dropped to 2% a little over 2%, indicating a tightening labor market and more, and more job availability. Um, so these developments, as I said, suggest that Mexico's economy uh, grows and um, is getting uh, stronger. <coughs> I apologize. <coughs> so um, this uh, creates uh, also a, lo a lot of changes, not only in education, but the social um, circumstances of our communities in Mexico are improving. So that's also good news for everybody. So um, to just give you a, a general idea of you know, what's coming and what things were included in this USMCA that now we're uh, already taking advantage of that is, um, so the, um, one of the first results is the trade volume that has grown uh, significantly and has created a lot of opportunities including the link for digitalizing government procedures to enhance security and efficiency at ports. In general terms, it's, it's, there's an effort and there's an impulse to reduce red tape for companies. That's something that is also in the agenda of the new president uh, that is taking office October the first, first woman ever uh, in Mexican history, which is good news. Uh, we don't know what's gonna happen here, but it's gonna be interesting. In any case, for everybody to follow, if you have a magic ball and you can tell me what will happen in November, uh, I will quickly pass that information to the transition team of uh, the President-elect Shane um, So this administration has proposed uh, the following to, to walk towards this direction. The creation of uh, the Agency for Digital Transformation and Communications. This is very interesting. That's very um, uh, innovative, actually. Uh, for, for the uh, ecosystem, economic ecosystem in Mexico. This initiative aims to consolidate existing projects from several government offices and agencies into a unified framework. You guys that are in the business sector, I'm pretty sure they know how painful it is to navigate those systems. So Mexico is finally modernizing and concentrating this to make things easier for everybody. The, um, the aim is to have 50% less permit procedures. 50% less time spending government procedures, 50% fewer requirements, and 80% of government procedures digitalized. So that will save everybody a lot of time and money. Also, our customs agency and our, uh, the agency that uh, takes care of taxes is, uh, will get modernized with this new administration. Um, new secure intelligent poor systems and unintrusive review systems to streamline customs. That's, that's gonna make and reduce time at the border crossing. That would be great not only uh, at the physical border, but also the uh, ports of entry. Uh, they are developing, de developing a, single a single customs platform that will allow for more efficiency and simplicity. And also the tax regime, as, as I mentioned, is gonna get um, more efficient and simplified. And there are several uh, projects in infrastructure that was one of the trademarks of the, uh, the outgoing administration. And, and of course, those are gonna be finished because uh, not all of them were fully finished, so that's one of the things. But at the end of the day, uh, the new uh, presidential team is talking about 13 new highways, seven new airports or modernization projects of airports, 12 seaports, um, expansion projects, three new freight rail routes, that one of them engages actually three countries, including Canada, and all new passenger railroads, same, same thing. Uh, the one I mentioned, that the one I'm, I'm most excited about is the Trans-Oceanic um, uh, Corridor. 
you know, the, the, the tiniest part of uh, Mexico geographically, there is going to be a corridor that will connect uh, the Gulf of Mexico with uh, the Pacific Ocean, and that will, you know, be an alternative at some point to the Panama Canal, so that will move things around for, for trade. <clears throat> and finally, I just want to allow me to finish with, with some thoughts. Um, we need to still work together in many things, you know, to make logistics better, uh, to collaborate in, in you know, the, the field of digital transformation, the true country. We have to catch up in some things. We have to develop many things in Mexico, but I think we're in the right path. Um, we have to make real some, some innovations that were introduced at the USMCA, like gender equality. You know, we have to work also on that. Um, and make sure that we keep talking about the USMCA. I think I told you this last time I was here. Uh, we pass NAFTA, we sign NAFTA, and then we kind of forgot about that. Uh, and we never made uh, our task to explain to the people in general <coughs> how the agreement <clears throat> works in, in their benefit. How when they buy a car, or they would, you know, when they buy those strawberries or drink that beer, how NAFTA is benefiting uh, their daily lives. Um, that's one thing that we need to do. Keep talking about that. But the other thing is to make sure that our <clears throat> workforce and young professionals are prepared for this. We all need to continue strengthening relationship between academic institutions, between the private sector and universities to make sure that you know, we are all prepared. The potential is there, you saw it. We can be, uh, we already are a very strong region in the world with figures that prove that we are strong. Um, but we have the potential of being the most prosperous area in the world. Uh, so it's, it's in our hands to seize that opportunity. Thank you so much and apologize again for the time being. That friends with. I don't think so. Yep. It's closed. Just trying to. There. Hello. Thank you so much, Angela. I don't know where you're sitting um, for your kind introduction and, you know, you didn't make any mistake pronouncing my name. It's good. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here with all of you for my first visit to Peoria as Consul General of Canada in Chicago. We are so grateful um, to this council for hosting us this week. And we are delighted to be here in partnership with my friend, Ambassador Torres, one thing that you all may not know, she is the Dean of the Consular Corps of Chicago. <laughs> Wait, I wanted to say that. It's, uh, it's very important and equally significant for Canada and Mexico to be here together because we can't tell the story of US trade and US prosperity without including Canada and Mexico side by side. We work together on almost everything from defense to border security and environmental protection. We enjoy one of the largest free trade zones in the world, responsible for nearly a third of global GDP. Together, our three countries are built, uh, have built an integrated North American supply chain that benefits everyone on the continent, bringing jobs, production, and growth back to our communities. Canada has its highest level of trade ever, goods and services, with both US and Mexico last year. Total trilateral merchandise trade, as measured by the total of each country's imports, from its other two USMCA's partners, amounted to $1.4 trillion, a five-fold increase since 1993 NAFTA. So we've made a lot of progress since. 
it was, I was very proud that Canada could share what that looks like in person with Governor Pritzker earlier this year when he visited Toronto and Montreal and signed a new agreement to boost trade between Illinois and Ontario. The world has become harder, more complicated, and less predictable. But one thing remains true. We are stronger and more prosperous when we work together, all three countries. But even as the world has become a more complicated place, that I think it's important to understand how Canada works with the United States. And so you can better navigate through it. We are a young country, but our economy punches far above our weight. Despite worldwide inflation, we have a five-year unemployment rate of just 5.3%. And we have a GDP growth by, that hits 3.4% last year, which is above the norm. Canada has enjoyed the fastest growing labor market in the G7, with 1 million more jobs today than before the pandemic. Part of that growth has been uh, driven by the growth of Canada itself. Last June, we hit a historic milestone as record setting Canadian population growth reached 40 million, and that was last June. The last time we checked, we were already at 41 million. We often said in Canada that our diversity is our strength. That has never been more true. And as more people join us in Canada, that means more workers and more consumers to power our shared North American economy. But we also owe our economic resilience to our vast network of free trade agreements that covers 61% of the world GDP, op opening doors to 1.5 billion consumers in more than 50 countries. And the US and Mexico are chief among them. As part of the US-Mexico-Canada agreement, USMCA, that updated NAFTA for the modern world. Our countries are more than just statistics, but the statistics are really impressive. Canada and the US share a trillion dollar trade and investment relationship that sees more than $2 billion worth of goods and services cross the border every day. Just picture that. That relationship supports millions of jobs in both our countries. And in fact, Canada buys more goods from the US market than do China, Japan, and UK combined. Illinois alone enjoys a two-way trade relationship with Canada worth nearly $90 billion each year. And that has grown by 40% since 2021. We do more trade with Illinois uh, than anyone, covering everything from energy to agriculture and medicine to motor vehicles. That's as true in Peoria as it is in Chicago. The 16 and 17 congressional district, I think they are here today, sell a combined $5 billion worth of goods and services to Canada every year. So it's no wonder that when American businesses in communities like Peoria look to expand, they so often choose Canada first as a launchpad launch pad to the wider world. Caterpillar, which we just visited this morning, it's a great example. When production in Alberta's oil sand began in the 60s, more than 150 cat machines built wards and prepared processing sites. Today, the area is home to the largest 
fleet of cat trucks operating around the world. Furthermore, and much of what we sell to each other goes into the goods we go to produce and sell ourselves, adding more and more values through the supply chain. Every car made in the United States is improved by the parts you source from Canada and vice versa. And the same is true of almost everything in every store in both of our countries. And we know the important role that the agriculture sector plays in this state. Canada is the second largest importer of U.S. agricultural product. In 2023, bilateral trade in agriculture between our two nations reached $73 billion. There are no other countries as deeply integrated with Illinois and the wider U.S. than Canada and Mexico. And that means we can help each other tackle global challenges like no other countries can. Oops. And there are plenty of other challenges to tackle. You are very familiar with one here in the Midwest, the future of mobility and the electric vehicle transition. Governor Pritzker wants to make Illinois a global hub for the EV revolution, retooling the Midwest automaking heritage to build the clean cars of the future. We have our own auto industry and our own EV ambitions, but we know that your success is our success. Canada heard your call and we answered. Lions Electric Company from my home province of Quebec became the first new vehicle assembly plant to open in the Chicago area in more than 50 years. That speak to another global challenge that we are tackling together. The need for critical minerals, such as lithium, phosphorus, and silicon to produce future economy products like EV batteries, and semiconductors. The US government had won its historic over-reliance over on China and other strategic adversaries. For these critical minerals, and has worked to reshore and ally shore these supplies in particular. The reliance has shifted Bloomberg recently ranked Canada as number one, overtaking China as the top global market for a secure, reliable, and sustainable lithium ion battery supply chain. We have 75% of the world's mining companies headquartered or listed in Canada and proven reserve for 19 of the 50 critical minerals identified by the US government. Our two countries signed a landmark joint action plan on critical minerals in 2020. And just this year, we announced the first core investment to further develop critical minerals operations and support the North American economy. And of course, we cannot talk about the energy transition without talking about the reason it's so important. It is important because our environment is under threat from pollution and climate change. Together, Canada and the US share some of the world's most precious natural resources, our Great Lakes. They contain a fifth or 20% of the world's surface fresh water, sustaining thousands of communities between our two countries. But those resources are under threat. More and more each year, increasing global temperature have triggered historic severe weather from tornadoes here in Illinois to wildfires like the ones raging 
right now in Jasper, Alberta. Canada is doing its part with a plan to reach nationwide net zero carbon emission by 2050, with an entry milestone of 40% below 2005 levels by the end of this decade. We are also working closely with the US at the federal and state level to help everyone adapt and thrive in a lower carbon world. For example, earlier this year, our governments jointly announced a binational EV charging corridor from Quebec City to Kalamazoo, securing fast charging infrastructure to speed travelers across the region. That deep integration extends from our economy to our shared defense of our homeland, of North America, and our way of life. Our military, intelligence, border patrol, law enforcement resources work more closely together than those of any other countries in the world. In addition to our collaboration through NORAD, Five Eyes, and NATO, but not all of our challenges live so close to home. Conflict has erupted around the globe, and Canada works tirelessly with the US and other allies to respond as one. We've all watched Russia wage a two-year-long full-scale war of aggression against Ukraine, an attack on democracy, an attack on freedom, an attack on the true world-based international order. Since the beginning of 2022, Canada has committed over $13.3 billion in funding to support Ukraine including $4 billion in military assistance. We are also helping Ukraine to better fight for its defense, and the Canadian Armed Forces have trained more than 40,000 Ukrainian soldiers at Allied base in the UK and Poland. And we have welcomed more than 220,000 Ukrainian refugees into our communities since the full-scale invasion began giving them sanctuary, I mean, the largest Ukrainian diaspora in the Western world. True. Sure. So whether we are looking and talking here in Illinois or around the world, Canada and the U.S. are working side by side to support our communities and tackle the biggest challenges. That's why we have a consulate here We've been here for the past 76 years in other, and in other key states throughout the, the country because the work of diplomacy extends so much farther than Ottawa and Washington. We need to build a world that works for Peoria as much as anywhere else. And if we can help you and help your businesses and your community, we want to know how we can help. Canada and the US and Mexico have built something truly remarkable together. But more importantly, we've built something that just works. Our cooperation has resulted in one of the most prosperous regions in the world, one that is secure in ways that our friends and foes alike look on with certain envy. With all the tension and uncertainty around the world, now is the time to double down. We must rely on each other as we always have. And this is a relationship that we cannot take for granted. We must preserve the gains that we have achieved under USMCA and otherwise. I know that Ambassador Torres shares my commitment to keep growing our relationship with Illinois and the wider Midwest. Okay. Wherever our trade takes you, know that Canada 
will be ready to help. And with the U.S. and Mexico by our side, I know that there is nothing we can't do together. Thank you. Thank you. Let me take out cheese. Take what you can say that. Yep. If you could. What do you want this? If you don't mind, if you could take your seats over there. The trip says do that because it's too. It's in my school. Okay, we can put them there, right? Sure. Like, whatever you want to, okay, whatever works. Look at it. 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 Thanks, Doug. Our plan has already been foiled. <laughs> That's why we are flexible. <laughs> That's a very good thing. Good. So I just wanted to take one more opportunity to thank PayWAC for putting on this program. They're such an incredible benefit to our community. Um, they're somebody that I utilize even on campus at Bradley University. Um, I know our students' um, experience is enriched by the incredible speakers that PayWAC's already bringing to our community and offering their resources to us. So that's a, just a, a wonderful thing and greatly appreciate everything that they do throughout the year. And I also wanted to again thank the um, ambassador and the consulate um, general for participating in this today, giving us their time. I really appreciated the insightful comments that they gave. I think I know, but then I find out I don't know and I learned a lot from um, your perspective. Um, we're gonna have questions at the end. Um, so if you don't mind holding those, I'll start out with some introductory questions. And then um, if you could, I guess, Angela, will you be passing a mic around or? Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay, so we'll have a, a mic at the end so you can ask your questions. And I think that's probably where we're gonna best spend our time is getting to some of your questions. As Angela mentioned, um, I'm in, I think that was the longest introduction I've ever had. But I am an international trade specialist at the Illinois SBDC International Trade Center at Bradley University. So my job is to increase exports for uh, small to medium-sized enterprises uh, coming from central Illinois. So day in and day out, we're looking at companies who want to be in Mexico and want to be in Canada selling to them. Uh, I, I think it was mentioned earlier, our largest as a country, our largest export market is Canada, followed by Mexico. And that also holds true for Illinois, and for our region, and for Peoria. So these are relationships that are very important to us, and this discussion takes on an added importance um, for our local companies. The chance to understand better the uh, trade agreement, and to make sure that they're utilizing it to its full extent. But maybe not surprisingly, it's something that's not always fully utilized. There are neighbors, sometimes they're not in front of mind, it's just natural that we're doing business with them. So again, this is a, a unique opportunity to delve into that a little deeper. Um, my first question leans off of that premise. Um, there's always been this tension between international trade creating opportunity for our businesses and enriching those companies. But at the same time, sometimes it's viewed as a threat to the US economy. So keeping in mind that of course, there's going to be truth to both sides of these um, um, viewpoints. And you did a very good job of highlighting some of the opportunities. I was wondering if you could comment on some of the threats and challenges that you think we need to manage better as far as the USMCA folks. And if I could, I, I'd let... Do go first. Right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Should I, should I move for that? I have to do both. Okay. 
Do we just? I do not They're speaking that for nothing. And they stole our microphones. They stole the time for it. I think that we, if we can um, take away all the things, because right away when we talk about free trade, it makes sense. And it's been proven that it makes sense. You saw the figures that Magnus shared, the ones that I shared. Um, those efforts that are able to consume local, I think, as, 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 as you mentioned, they, they, they may seem appealing, but the one that the, the, the way that it works today is, is um, almost impossible to think to consume 100% local or national. That that was in system one, unless we're a country that I'm not going to mention. I know. We, you know, I'm a bit too close to agree. Um, not only that, we saw a very uh, palpable example of what could happen with the, the, the production chains are, are disrupted. We saw that during the pandemic. And we have this infrastructure already in place that provides certainty to the exchanges among our three countries. We should make, well, we need to make sure that those um, mechanisms are well oiled so we can face in, in, in a better position, uh, in a stronger position, the next challenge that the world would take, face. Like, you know, not, hopefully not about that, but then we, we need to get ready for anything. And that proved to be right. You know, we could um, mobilize um, equipment, medical equipment, you know, medical supplies in all three countries. Not any when it was a major challenge to bring those supplies from other regions. So I think that um, yeah, there is a tension, but it's also the um, need for us to talk more about all the advantages that we have. We have free trade, and uh, the, the other thing is that I I. Really too young, many of you are too young to remember, but when NAFTA was negotiated, um, it, it's almost like catching up with reality now. The governments were catching up with what's already happening organically among the business communities in the entire of countries and the three economies. Uh, so that's uh, why we have, you know, negotiated NAFTA and it became so successful. The need to provide certainty. We have this aid, we have these agreements, we have and, uh, you know, many um, areas or sectors that may feel that they are um, weakened by the, 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 the trade-off of train. But at the end of the day, we have the institutional mechanisms to resolve these issues. And I think that brings certainty. And as you know, there is nothing that business community loves more than in that present certainty. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my team prepared some great uh, statistics and I... I have my paper, so I, I want you to hear that. Um, first of all, I can say that uh, trade uh, can be complicated all over the world. It is complicated, but for some reason in North America and with USMCA, trade is simple. So in other words, the USMCA is working for all three countries. And uh, second, I would like to add that 79% of goods that Canada sells to the U.S. are incorporated directly into your supply chain. So this is a great advantage for the United States. And Canadian companies operating in the U.S. directly employ almost 900,000 people in the United States. And it is, there is another 7.8 million American jobs that are supported by your trade with Canada. So those are all pluses for our two countries. USFCA, by the way, uh, is a win-win-win. It's a win for the United States. It's a win for Mexico. It's a win for Canada. And it works. So... Although we all know that it is coming up for review in 2026, this is exactly what it is. It will be a review because it works. And we started, all of us, we start working on making sure that it will remain as such. Critical minerals uh, are a strong Canadian example of that principle in action. Helping the U.S., 
fill resource gap for batteries, semiconductors, as opposed to sourcing them directly from China. We have them next door. <laughs> and also, you wanted to know about threats and challenges. The threat of growing isolationism. Uh, iso yes, not okay. so, like, isolation. Again. And, and around the world has affected the ability to advance free trade agreements. And we discussed it before lunch. That's why we are seeing fewer and fewer free trade agreements mm. because of that. <laughs> and also the Buy America on your side, which is kind of protectionism. So we need to stay away from that, you know. And there are bipartisan efforts to make sure that, you know, we alleviate that as well. So at the end of the day, Jim, totally, I think, the free trade agreement that we have now with our three countries, it's a win-win. Very nice. Thank you. Yeah, right. Now, I apologize just from some of your comments. Now I'm going to go off script a little bit just because you brought it up. Um, the USMCA has proven to be a lot more than just a um, economic or trade agreement. It also oftentimes seems to serve as a bulwark for stability, particularly when we're in times where there's a lot of geopolitical uncertainty. You both touched on this, but would you mind commenting a little more on how this economic agreement, this trade agreement, helps in that process, helps to create stability? We used to say in Mexico something very silly that um, the U.S. and Mexico were, you know, ordering cupcakes, but far away in many ways before U.S. and C.A. You know, there were disagreements, political disagreements, um, disagreements on how to deal with, you know, international conflict around conflict. But you know, throughout history, in the tough times, we have always been partners. You know, when, when, when things get critical, that, you know, first of all, second of all, um, we are neighbors. And we change that um, perception, I think, we are neighbors, we know each other, to we are partners now. Uh, after NAFTA, of course, we became partners. And the future of one country depends on the future of the other. We keep saying that there is no other relationship that Mexico has that's an order impact in our stability domestic than the US and of course Canada in the form of our US associate. We're like minded countries in many ways. And we express that in international uh, organizations, international foreign generation. Uh, that's a good thing. And when we disagree, there are the institutional mechanisms to deal with those disagreements. So, of course, we need to work in many things. Um, but let, let me give you an, an, an example. We are living really complicated times to what happened to what's happening in the Middle East and you know, all parts of Venezuela and Frank, recently in the news. Um, but because you mentioned Ukraine at Madeleine. Um, at the end of the day, in the, in the UN, and despite you know, many uh, political expressions, national political expressions that could have disagreed, Mexico, the position of Mexico was very clear and was very much aligned uh, to what was expressed in the US and, and all the black like, the Congress in the international forest. So what, I, what I'm trying to say is that um, at the end of the day, this partnership that we have in that, that goes way beyond what we express in, in trade, you know, or economic exchanges. And there's something else that is very unique of the relationship that we have with the U.S., Mexico and the U.S., and that is the 35 million persons of Mexican origin that live in this country. So that makes us, I keep saying, you know, we're not only neighbors, not only partners, we're family. Yeah. You know, so those family connections is what fills this um, closeness that we have with the U.S. And that brings stability, that brings confidence in international affairs in general. Good. So um, on our side, I would add that absolutely um, mm -hmm. the agreement makes U.S. more stronger than it was before. 
when dealing with geopolitical, because just take the example of the Russian invasion, okay? So what, what happened to the Europeans after that invasion? They were left in the cold, practically, okay? Because they were relying so much on Russian oil to hit their homes. Great. So um, when we in North America are looking at those type of dynamics, it was good to bring back manufacturing and the U.S. was at the forefront of it. You know, repatriating manufacturing from China was the best thing that ever happened because they were manufacturing things for us that we needed badly, but that we could not receive fast enough to take care of us during the pandemic. And I think also that the pandemic has helped to strengthen that relationship between our three countries because we repatriated so much, we are doing our own um, equipment, we are developing our own vaccines, we, are, we have our own distribution chain, and before, it wasn't like that. We were all waiting on Asia to send us things. So the pandemic helped us strengthen that relationship as well. It's a lot of these things we know, but we need to be reminded of. And just, I can see by the heads nodding the, yes, this is something that we do understand. Angela, can we open it up to questions on the floor? So if, if you have a question, maybe you could say it loudly enough for Jim to hear and he'll repeat it for all of us with the microphone. Anybody? Okay. By the way, is the USMCA significant proof of an asset? Just like you can Best of not. Repeat the question. Is the question? Yeah. That's it. Is the U.S. MCA significant improvement over NAFTA or just a new name? He's the expert. Let me say one thing very quickly. It is a huge improvement. It included many things that were left out in the first one. And the world changed a lot since the 90s to, you know, the time when we uh, revisited NAFTA and, and created the U.S. MCA. So we introduced a lot of new things. Like I mentioned mm -hmm. this the gender uh, equality thing, innovation, um, digital um, it's like exactly. So many other things that you know make things better, and and we're tied to what we're living nowadays. Mm -hmm. And because because we are living in an evolving world, things are changing constantly, and that's the reason why it is called for a review once in a while. So uh, um, there are a lot of things that that will be addressed in the review, take specifically in new technologies. So we, we should look for that. Each girl. And maybe I'll just add, um, you know, when, when I've done it with force, I think, I think it's clear to all of us how different the global economy looked at that point and since what it's since become. And, and you know, I think from both of our countries' perspectives, that while it was not our, had their, our decision or choice to open up NAFTA, uh, but I think we all see this bloody opportunity to botanize the agreement. Out of, you know, uh, that's notoriously to the two things, but there's now a dedicated chapter to small and medium sizes enterprises, uh, and she mentioned the digital economy. So, so I think we, we turned what was a challenge to come to the. Yeah. Back then, so. I say. Thank you. Well, thank you. I love numbers and you guys gave me a so on. Um, can I ask two questions? One is, is some of the issues that sometimes we hear is that these agreements cause jobs to move out of the country. Is there a tool to this? And you know how what, what is the actual reality? So this is number one. Number two, with the end by indication literally getting stored out. Do you see any negative impacts if conservative or strict anti-immigration rules are implemented? Thank you. 
Okay, this toast one. It was, it was about, um, do you remember this, your first question? Uh, oh, oh, tulips. Okay. Just, 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 okay. So we have not experienced that in, in Canada specifically, but I, I, I think it's the opposite that is happening with the agreement. The agreement is job creation. That's one of the goals of the agreement. So I don't think that um, jobs are being lost in one country or another because uh, the agreement within itself took care of that, you know. And more and more we are uh, hearing job creation as opposed to uh, losing the jobs. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I'm gonna add just one thing to, to what Madeline just said. It's not that the jobs are lost because, you know, we start trading with another country. The, the jobs change, you know, the kind of jobs change and that's the economy. That's how it works. That's why it's so important to build partnerships with uh, technical schools or universities to make sure that our workforce is prepared for the kind of economy they are going to lead, that generation is going to lead. So you see that with the free trade agreement or without free trade agreement, um, the, the world, the global economy makes you know uh, things different for each generation. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, yeah, as, as I said, that when we deeply incise. Um, the narrative about free trade, same things happen with integration. It's, I think you tell them it's a very simple thing about supply and demand. And what has happened in the US is that in the last decades, it has been used for, for political purposes. So all the narrative the, the about integration has been used for political purposes. And that was very complicated. It's very contentious to even attempt to talk about, for example, immigration reform in, in the US Congress. Um, the, I understand why we understand what is behind all this, but we also understand that it's being used, um, particularly in electoral cycles, for this purpose. At the end of the day, as I said, it's an issue of supply and demand. That's one thing. And the other thing is a reality. I mentioned that we have 35 million persons of uh, Mexican origin in this country. The large majority of them are either citizens, second or third generation, or residents. Um, the population, the undocumented population is no larger than five million, and it fluctuates. So if you compare the 35 million with you know, five million, million, the difference is huge. And you know what is really sad? When those political um, comments or narrative um, mingle or, or get intertwined with you know, racism and xenophobia, because it's not only those specific undocumented persons that are here, by the way, working and paying taxes, um, that you know what I think are going to see the negative um, impact of that narrative. Is the 35 million that look different? So that's the danger of this kind of, of mentality. Um, we need to, to make sure that whatever policies, both countries have adopt, this is not an issue that can or should be tackled unilaterally or only from one perspective, it has to do with the social and um, fabric of our countries, it has to do with our culture, it has to do uh, with many other things, as I, as I mentioned, um, family connections, for example. So uh, I don't like the, 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 the proposals that just take care of what a child takes. I, I like when things are seen, you know, comprehensive. We just have a few minutes left, so I think I'll let Paywack um, make some concluding remarks if you have any events coming up you want to highlight. But again, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Ambassador Torres and Madame Lafakia. <laughs> so um, I wish I spoke French. <laughs> so, uh, in any case, though, thank you all for coming today. I hope you have learned something. I hope you have been stimulated in your thoughts about the USMCA and our relations with our Canadian and Mexican neighbors, that this is, in fact, a neighborhood. And, and the better neighbors we are, the better off all of us are. And so the World Affairs Council invites you to join us 
as in become a member of the World Affairs Council. We typically have an event every month. This month we have two. Um, but uh, you can find us at PAWAC. There are membership brochures in the back. And on your tables or at the back, there is information about our program on August 19th with General David Petraeus. So um, this is a, a unique opportunity. He will talk about his book, Conflict, The Evolution of War from 1945 to Ukraine. He'll also be asked about Gaza and other places around the world that have erupted since he wrote his book. And so what lessons have we learned from past conflicts that we should be employing or might be employing uh, to deal with current and future conflicts. So join us for that, uh, become a sponsor. Uh, in any case though, thank you all for coming today and uh, thank you again for such stimulating conversation and Jim for guiding us through some good questions. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.